everyone. I'm Sister Vasa, and live from Vienna, Austria, it's Saturday morning. I hope you've all been well while I was away. I was in the United States, you know. Uh, I was doing my audio podcast on weekdays on patreon.com slash Sister Vasa, so do join us there if you miss me when I'm not here on YouTube, and tune in to our morning coffee podcast where you can learn every weekday about the saints of the day, both new calendar and older calendar, and reflect on a bit of scripture as you begin your day. But what happened when I came back from the United States, in case you haven't heard, we just recently had this terrorist attack right here outside my window. And I did see uh, the terrorist and his machine gun, and he was in a ski mask, you know, with the openings for the eyes and the mouth. And this was all in the evening. I had already gone to bed, but I heard a strange sound. I realized I never heard what a machine gun sounds like. Uh, anyway, I saw him shoot the police officer. Then he came around closer to our building. He was standing right under where my windows were. I will show you how it looks right now outside my window and you'll see the candles. Uh, there are many candles actually in the various spots where people were killed. The ones I will show you are right at the Asian restaurant where two people were killed. You can see this Asian restaurant and the candles set up. You can also see perhaps, or maybe it's too far, but you see the wall across from uh, on the far side of the Danube Canal that it's painted black. Usually it's full of graffiti, but the graffiti artists have painted over their work uh, in black paint as a sign of grieving as the city grieves right opposite this whole area where the shootings occurred. And there, there's a little entrance to a garage, the glass building, part of it is boarded up because the terrorist was shooting behind there and he also shot the police officer right behind that building. And then my friends, the police officers that arrived, very heavily armed police officers that I saw from this side, uh, they uh, very soon after this whole scene uh, killed the terrorist on the other side of our building and he was lying there for hours because they could not approach his body until they had a certain special team come and unarm or disarm, I don't know what the term is, his belt that had explosives in it. So all of this was very dramatic, of course, but now the city is healing. As you saw, people are constantly coming, placing flowers and candles on the spots, praying, contemplating, whatever it is that people do, uh, according to what they believe in or don't believe in. But my friends, now I would like to introduce to you our very distinguished guest. He is the Reverend Dr. Samuel Gibson an Anglican priest and author of this unique book, The Apostolos. It is a scholarly work and unique because it is the only monograph we have to date on that liturgical book, The Apostolos, that contains the readings from the Acts of the Apostles and the Epistles in the Byzantine liturgy. But let me tell you about Father Sam, as everybody calls him. He is vicar at St. George's Edgebaston in the Diocese of Birmingham in England. He is married to Charlotte, who was a guest on our show some months ago. You remember Charlotte probably, my beloved viewers. She is an ordinand, that means she is training to become a priest in the Church of England. So not only is Father Sam a priest, but his wife is preparing to be a priest. We're going to ask him what that's like in case you've ever wondered what it's like for a man to be married to a woman who is an ordinant. Father Sam and Charlotte have two children who are in infant school. He has a family background in the Salvation Army, 
and became a committed Christian in an Anglo-Catholic parish in his teenage years. He trained for a ministry at St. Stephen's House at Oxford, having pursued a career in biblical studies as a layperson. He received a BA with honors in classical literature and civilization and theology, first class, from the University of Birmingham in 2011. Then he received from that same university an MA with distinction in electronic scholarly editing in New Testament philology in 2013. And then a PhD from the University of Birmingham in New Testament studies in 2016. Finally, Father Sam received a MTH with distinction in applied theology from the University of Oxford in 2018. Now he trained for ministry at Oxford at St. Stephen's House and was ordained deacon in the Church of England in June 2017 and priest in 2018. During curacy, as Father Sam wrote me, he explored a vocation to Christian teaching and the role of pastor theologian among a diverse community which confirmed, challenged, and stretched his previous academic experience. His calling, he recognized, is to bridge the worlds of academic study, pastoral formation, and the wider church, and to engage people at large with the truth of the gospel in a way that is attractive, compelling, and fruitful. The center of his spiritual life is Jesus Christ as known through study, service, and prayer, and especially through the daily office and regular celebration of the Eucharist. He is a Franciscan tertiary and lives by a basic rule of life. For Father Sam, the study and teaching of theology is not something merely academic, but understood within the lived practice of discipleship and with the church in the fullness and diversity of its communal and worshiping life. A firm believer in education for all, he is passionate about lay teaching and formation and enjoys working with people in a range of backgrounds, vocations, and life circumstances. So I will say that in Father Sam, I have recognized a kindred spirit. Now let's welcome him, give him a warm round of applause, and let's find out what it's like to be a scholar and a priest, a father and a husband in the Church of England. Hello, Father Sam. Welcome to our show. Hello, Sister Vassa. Lovely to be with you today. Well, our viewers have already met Charlotte, uh, and now I'm sure everybody's delighted to meet you as well, Father. I will begin right with our questions. First of all, could you please tell us, Father Sam, about when and why you decided to become a priest? Of course, um, I can try and tell you a little bit about my background and how I came to be a priest. Um, I grew up in an evangelical Christian family in a church called the Salvation Army, uh, which you and some of your listeners might have heard of. Um, it's, a, it's a Protestant denomination, um, particularly famous for wearing uniforms and playing brass instruments at Christmas, right. in, in England anyway. And so I grew up in a, in a Christian home and uh, my, my parents were ministers in that tradition, although it doesn't have ordination in the way that maybe um, Anglicans and Orthodox would think of. So that was, that was my background. Um, but later on, I came to attend a Church of England church, the Church of England parish as a teenager. And that's, that's where I became a committed Christian, uh, you know, I guess you would say I had a, con a conversion experience there. And old, that's where I felt. How old were you then? I was 15. So, um, and, and I, I had a, a sense at that point that God was calling me to be a priest. Just a little notion or an inkling. Um, but 
I didn't do anything about it and didn't really know what it meant. So really from the first point that I gave my life to Jesus Christ in an intentional way um, for myself, rationally, if you like, I knew that I was supposed to be ordained. Um, he gave me that as a gift, but it took a, a little while to unpack that gift, if that makes any sense. So, uh, well, first, you did you have to be, be baptised to enter the Anglican Communion? That's right. So the Salvation Army doesn't practice any sacraments or sacramental rites, um, which is quite distinctive. And so um, I wasn't baptised as an infant like many Christians would be. Um, I was dedicated to God's service instead. Um, so um, my family, my parents and I were actually baptised together when I was six. Um, and we were baptised in the Church of England by something approaching full immersion. I remember standing in a paddling pool and the Bishop of Birmingham throwing a large amount of water uh, over my head, which will probably please some Orthodox listeners. <laughs> right, so close enough, right? Uh, the <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we had long periods in the Russian Orthodox tradition anyway of just this sprinkling business. So, uh, mm. you know, uh, it's been allowed, cut economia, you know? Uh, yes. In some cases, although the, nowadays, as far as I know, we try not to let that happen. But, you know, in the colder regions in Siberia and throughout centuries, uh, it was practiced to just have sort of this sprinkling. Uh, Father Sam, that's when you became serious about your faith, right? You, uh, well, you had been baptized at age six, then at age, age 15, I understand you were, you began going to an Anglican church on your own, and then... Yes, that's right. So, how did it happen that you began the path uh, of preparation for the priestly ministry? Well, um, I, made, I made a decision to study some theology at university. Um, I, did a, I, did, I actually did what we would call in Britain a joint honours degree, which is sort of two, two subjects for the price of one. So it was a, a little bit of classics and a little bit of biblical studies and theology thrown in. So I made, I made a conscious decision to do some theology, but it was really at university through um, the ministry of the chaplains at university and through peers and friendship and Christian groups that that vocation really got fleshed out for me. And I started to see what it might mean to actually serve in Christian ministry. And so after my BA I then started an MA and a doctorate but by that point I had in mind the idea that it wasn't just an academic preparation but it would be for active ministry in the church. Right and is this when you moved to uh, St Stephen's house at Oxford? Yes that's right I, I did my kind of academic training at the University of Birmingham uh, which is where I've lived most of my life. And then for for kind of priestly formation, I was sent to seminary in Oxford, St Stephen's House, where I did a, another, another theology degree through the theology faculty there. But the focus was mostly on pastoral theology, um, theology as lived in the life of the church, Whereas I joke that I've kind of done my impractical and unpastoral theology before that. All oh, right, right. Do you do you consider this uh, your opus manus here <laughs> uh, to be not practical? Well, I would contend that it is deeply practical and pastoral in various ways, but perhaps ways that need more teasing out um, than is obviously apparent. Uh, because on one level, it's it's a I recognise that it's a, a dense study of texts. Right, but it it, it is uh, quite fascinating. Uh, I want I wanted to leave that question to uh, the last one, 
Um, if our viewers will bear uh, with me here, I'd like to ask uh, two more questions of Father Sam and then get to how your practical ministry is informed by your studies of the Byzantine uh, lectionary. Uh, Father Sam, could you take us through your typical day of your uh, pastoral ministry as a vicar at St. George's Parish? Sure. Um, it's the one thing about being a parish priest is it's it's an extremely varied life and it, it may be especially so for Church of England ministers but I could I could talk you through a, a day um, so the, the most obvious beginning to the day is normally being woken up by my children who are four and six, four and six. <laughs> they normally wake <laughs> They normally wake myself and Sharna up before we're ready to be awake. <laughs> um, <laughs> what time is as that? As most parents. <laughs> what time is that? So, uh, uh, oh, time? well, about half past six, quarter to seven in the morning. Um, you know, we're, we're not monastics, so we, we, we don't spend all night in vigil prayers or anything. We have to get our sleep. Um, um, I so, yeah, some so. of us also don't spend, uh, you know, all night in vigil prayers. I'm not going to say which one of us <laughs> I'm talking about. <laughs> so, so family life shapes the routine, and, and we wake up and, and get ready together and take them to school. And then, um, then I go into my church and say morning prayer, which is the beginning of the day. And that's a fixed point in the day. And, and in the Church of England, we have a, an idea. Well, in fact, it's, it's part of our canon law um, that priests are required to say morning and evening prayer, preferably in their churches. So, so you say the, this alone or are there people there? So sometimes there are people there who come to join me and the doors are open. And sometimes there's a small group. Uh, sometimes it could just be me, depending on what other people are doing. And what what is this? Is it a, a service in the uh, daily office? What is it called? It is. It's a form of the daily office. So um, the Church of England at the Reformation um, created a, a, a liturgical service book called the Book of Common Prayer. And the Book of Common Prayer is kind of an abbreviated version of the monastic offices of the Western Church. So we have an order of morning prayer and an order of evening prayer, which draw on some of those traditions. And in my case, I say an updated contemporary version of that. OK, uh, and then what do you do? And how long does that last? 20 minutes, half an hour. Something like that. Okay, yeah. and when you're done with that, what do you do? Oh, well, that's when all the varied stuff begins. So I could, uh, I could draw on yesterday when I went into our parish Church of England school and I led a collective worship for the school students. This is a primary school up to age 11. So, uh, yeah, I would be asked to give them some teaching on a Bible passage or a theme or something like that and engage with them. Right. Um, and after that? Um, then there might be meetings, things like, uh, for example, uh, in the Church of England, the Church of England being the established church means that parish priests are often a community figure and a, a link for people in the local neighbourhood. So um, I spent a portion of last week meeting with representatives of local charities who do work within my parish, asking how I can support their work, things like that. Right. Um, it could be pastoral work, like visiting people, taking them communion, praying with them, things like that. Or it could be administrative, you know, uh, I'm responsible for a church which has heating bills and a boiler and a roof and walls <laughs> and finances and things. Yeah. Sure. It's, it's, uh, has it been difficult in the COVID time financially? It is difficult. I think, I think most church communities of any tradition are struggling. Um, 
yes, it, it's challenging, especially when we haven't been able to gather for public worship. Um, right, right. As people aren't coming. As we like to. Yeah, mm. people at home. We have to try to remember <laughs> that the churches and priests still have to live. Um, but uh, Father, so it, we're getting to lunchtime at this point, or have we passed it? Do you have lunch? Sometimes. Sometimes I meet someone for lunch and, and have a conversation over lunch. Yeah. Right, right. And then, so all this time you're away from home, right? You're away from home. You're yeah. not at home. Uh, and then in the afternoon, what happens in the afternoon? More, more of this, right? Yeah, it can be. Or I could be um, here in my study at the vicarage um, preparing a homily for Sunday or reading. Um, you know, an, an important part of my life is reading and, and academic study. Um, I also, as part of my current role, do some theological teaching and ministry formation across our diocese, it's the Diocese of Birmingham. So I might be preparing that ready for other, other people, ready for the evening. Uh, Father Sam, what time would you return home for the evening? Well, I, I'm slightly unusual in that because I have children, um, I and lots of Anglican clergy have children. So, so the pattern of my life is partially shaped by their needs and quite rightly. Um, so I might pick them up from school and give, you know, give them some dinner. Um, and that period between about three and five or six is family time. Um, right. You know, think homework to do and so on and so forth. Um, and, then, and then the next session of the day begins. I would normally say evening prayer, um, usually at home, uh, because my children would be going to bed by then. And then uh, an evening could be a service, an event, a meeting. So um, this sort of takes us into our next question. So I've told our viewers that Charlotte, your wife, uh, discerned a vocation in common with yours, that she was also feeling called to become a priest. And presently, if I'm not mistaken, she is an ordinand, is that correct? And she's still That's preparing, right. she has not yet been ordained. So I'd like to ask, what is that like? And maybe you can share, uh, do you notice somehow uh, that her approach is in some ways different uh, to this priestly vocation? Is it complementary maybe to yours or, or different? Just share with us some of your observations, Father. Thank you. That's a really interesting set of questions. Um, uh, well, to, uh, on one level, I think it's a good thing. Uh, I, I affirm Charlotte's vocation to priestly ministry. And when she told me that, that, that she felt this call from God in her life, I instantly actually thought it made sense of the story of her life and, and could identify the gifts that God had given her. Um, and as someone who knows her quite well, possibly better than anyone else, um, I, I could see where God had been working. I think that, I think that all vocations in the body of Christ are complementary, right? Um, back to... So we share in, Charlotte and I share in common our baptismal vocation. So we're, we're both baptised members of the body of Christ. And so whatever we did, God would be using us to bless one another because that's what happens in the church. Mm -hmm. um, we're also married, which we think of as a sacrament, you know, a holy mystery in which a man and a woman become one flesh. Um, and so God is using us in that vocation to fulfil his purposes. And then we will also come to share in the sacrament of holy orders together, according to our understanding. Um, does that mean that there aren't differences, tensions, all the rest, as happens in the body of Christ? No. 
and, and we're very different people and we exist in our own right. But certainly God uses each of those sacramental relationships to build up and encourage the other. And there are times when Charlotte has encouraged me in my ministry and I've, you know, been held up by her and I think the other way round too that there are times when Charlotte is held up by me uh, if that makes any sense. What does that mean held up uh, stopped? No sorry that's a that's a little bit of um, Protestant colloquialism there maybe. Uh, uh, given strength, given grace, a means of grace to one another. Um, you know, the, the baptismal vocation, you know, being a Christian is challenging, isn't it? It's, it's about taking up our cross and following Jesus. Um, being married is a lifelong calling, which is sacrificial, is also full of joy and, and blessing, um, but it's also sacrificial. And, and being a priest in God's church is demanding and complex and sacrificial too. So to be able to support one another in all of those things is is really, really important. Right. Uh, I just think it, it would be fascinating uh, to people to hear about that because it's something that would never happen, you know, in the same way, uh, even though, mm. I mean, in the Orthodox uh, Church of today. Uh, but as as you've touched upon so articulately, of course, as the royal priesthood or that baptismal uh, and with, you know, the, the anointing uh, that we all have in holy chris chrism, uh, we have a calling somehow to, uh, to self-offer, right, uh, and so forth, and to celebrate on a certain level. Uh, but Father Sam, what I was thinking is that perhaps insofar as you minister to people and our pastors now, both of you, because she already does uh, a lot of church work that she told us about, um, are there insights, for example, into how to deal with situations? And insofar as church administration goes and the presence of women amongst men and vice versa, is there some kind of balancing out going, you know, happening. Uh, I'll share with you something I heard an Orthodox priest say when a discussion came up of, in general, the idea of female priesthood. It, nobody was discussing it actually in this context as a positive thing. They, they, there was a group of priests, I was at some diocesan uh, kind of council thing, and um, I heard some priests who were converts from Protestantism to Orthodoxy, and they had become priests in the Orthodox Church. One of the priests said that when in his previous uh, Protestant communion, they started ordaining uh, women, that the culture of male fellowship of only male priests was totally destroyed. He was describing this as some destruct destruction. To my ear, it sounded like Oh, well, well, I didn't say anything, but I thought that is indeed, you know, such a shame that the boys club was, <laughs> right. Um, you know, but I could also under I, I can understand that people have their ways of fellowship. In any event, I, you know, I shouldn't make light of the importance for sometimes people to come together on whatever level. Maybe, you know, I don't know. Um, it's just not my uh, forte knowing the ways in which men need to come together, maybe only amongst men, right? So I don't know if I've said some, I'm digging a hole for myself here that I can't stop <laughs> digging. <laughs> Whatever. I'm, I'm, I'm sharing with you uh, this, what was said. And I'd like to ask you, uh, what is it like to have women amongst the clergy? and is there something that you personally perceive as a different kind of input or is there no 
does this make no difference? I mean, I don't know if you ever knew, you're too young maybe to have known the reality of only male priests. So there we go, I'll stop talking. No, that, that's really interesting. Um, I should say that from my own background, um, the, the Salvation Army, although it doesn't have priests, was one of the pioneering churches when it came to women's ministry women speaking in public, women preaching and so on, and, and teaching adults rather than just, just women and children. So I probably had in the back of my mind of my upbringing a notion that it was natural for women to lead um, in that way. But I did train at a seminary where around half of the candidates um, didn't accept the ordination of women to the priesthood. So that there are people in the Church of England who feel strongly, for, for various reasons, that women can't, can't be priests. To answer your question about the distinctiveness of women in ministry, I, I kind of want to be a typical Anglican and say yes and no. <laughs> yes, that there, there are there are it does change the dynamics because gender is important in, in society. Um, and yes, there are specific situations, I think, where women bring unique gifts and perspectives to priesthood. The most obvious one maybe is safeguarding of children and vulnerable adults. You know, often women are more approachable and trusted um, to deal with difficult pastoral situations where there's been um, abuse or things like that, partly because of distrust that's developed of, of an all-male priesthood. But I wouldn't want to universalise that. And the no part is, I'm quite, I'm quite egalitarian in my anthropology. I, I think that human beings are human beings fundamentally. So I think that men and women are given the, the similar gifts are distributed to both men and women and similar flaws and failings are distributed to men and women. So actually, I think on one level, having female priests isn't that different from having male priests. I think that human nature is what it is. Um, sorry if that's a little bit of a fudge of an answer. Well, you know, without considering, say, evolutionary biology, some people might uh, also not appreciate this for gender studies, but uh, I think that there are probably scientific facts and, and insights that one might, well, that I, for one, don't know enough about, but that I think probably objectively play a role here somehow. I mean, our observations of do you find women to be different as priests is almost like just gossiping. <laughs> you know? It's subjective. And I think you're right in as much as there are now priests who, for example, know what it is to bear a child. And therefore, when they preach about the incarnation, for example, they have an intimate personal experience of what it would mean to have a baby in the womb in a way that I can never have. And so of course that will bring something radically different, but the oh, spectrum of experience. Motherhood, right? Yeah. It's interesting. I think Charlotte touched very profoundly on the topic of motherhood, but I have to rewatch our interview. Um, but you know, the church is often compared to or signifies like a certain kind of mother, the church, the mother, or, very differently, the church as the bride of Christ, it's a little different to be a bride and to be a mother, but a woman married to a priest like Charlotte to you has been both a bride, she is now a mother. So in those ways, I think it's interesting because obviously male priests are also participating in the motherhood of the church. And there are sometimes also in the Byzantine rite in any event, in the Byzantine rite, there are female, there's female symbolism, for example, in the vesting uh, ceremony, when the priest dons a stiharia, stiharian, he pronounces, or in the case of a bishop, it's pronounced for him, this verse from Isaiah 61, verse 10. 
Uh, my soul shall rejoice in the Lord, for he has clothed me with the robe of salvation and the garment of joy. He has put a mitre on me uh, as on a bridegroom and adorned me with ornaments as a bride. That's the part I want to say. And, uh, you know, Iyaka Nivestu Ukrasima Krasatoyu is the verse that I would know in Slavonic. It's, uh, it's interesting to me that with the presence of female symbolism, we see alongside the female symbolism for the church in general, that there is some kind of, well, uh, perhaps not gendered in our usual sense, but feminine qualities to pastoral ministry. And I would presume that a female ordinand and priest would have a different connection to this motherly or female uh, aspect of ministry. So perhaps you could share your thoughts on that with us. Yes, I, I, couldn't, um, I couldn't and wouldn't speak for women. Um, it's okay, I'm been... not going to attack <laughs> you here. <laughs> no, no but, but, but my wife might tell me off. Um, no, um, I, I, um, what, one really interesting piece of writing on this in the Western tradition, reflecting Western rites of priesthood, and, and priestly celebration of the liturgy is by Sarah Coakley, who was a professor at Cambridge and is now in the States. And I can't remember the exact reference to the article, but she has some really interesting essays on that feminine imagery in priesthood and how men and women might relate to it in a Western context. So that's a feature of our tradition too. Um, I, I, I guess I would, I would say that I would think of priesthood primarily first in terms of the royal priesthood of the baptized and that the priesthood is the sacred humanity of Christ offered to the father. Um, and so what ordained priesthood is, is a particular way of participating in that sacred humanity of Christ. And because Christ came for all, both men and women, both men and women are able to participate in the priesthood of Christ. And that that contains both masculine and feminine dimensions, which different people would appropriate and understand in different ways, according to their gender and context. Um, so, so going back to what you were saying a little while ago about um, the female dynamic changing a kind of all male priesthood. Perhaps one of the one of the things going on there is that actually the priesthood in both East and West has been all male, but has been thought of in female terms, you know, with that feminine imagery, and that in some way priests have been people who've stood on the boundary between masculine and feminine especially when they, where they were celibate priests, especially in the West. They were exempt from the normal conventions of domestic life, which is gendered between men and women in traditional societies. And that maybe what's going on there is that women are coming in and men are saying, well, they're, they're relating to this imagery in a new way that makes me feel uncomfortable or unsure and that that needs some negotiation theologically. So that's my kind of profound thought on it. It might just be that they like beer or, or hunting or whatever other masculine activities they associate with being men, but you know. Uh, yeah, I can't, uh, you know, I, uh, I certainly don't presume to speak for all priests. I'm a, the daughter of a priest, by the way, so I, um, yeah. I have relatives also that are priests, and so the whole culture of that is familiar to me. Um, I can't say, I guess it also depends on different characters, uh, but because I come from the Orthodox Church that has the married priesthood, uh, it wouldn't be at least as I've experienced it in my life, I didn't find that for my father, for example, would just get together with other priests. He was quite well integrated into, our family was also quite open to the community. It wasn't a 
closed in on itself family. But, but thank you for sharing your insights, Father Sam, about that and about your lovely family. I'd like to get to questions related to your uh, unique, really, research. For the viewers at home, I want to say that uh, the Byzantine lectionary is really not uh, by any means the best uh, studied or researched area of the Byzantine rite, uh, to say the least. And Father Sam's monograph on this topic, having gone through the manuscript tradition and analyzing all sorts of aspects of the complicated tradition of the lectionary, specifically of the Book of Acts, and the various epistles, mostly Pauline, because we happen to have most epistles of St. Paul, but also the other epistles of the New Testament, um, as they are uh, integrated into uh, Byzantine worship. So Father, I wanna ask you about your extensive knowledge of this, and because we can't cover that much of it, um, I will ask you in very general terms, uh, how does your research of the Byzantine Apostolos inform and inspire perhaps your approach to sharing and teaching scripture as we understand the context of liturgy and inserting a certain passage specifically from say an epistle of St. Paul into a liturgy is somehow exegesis, right? It's applying the passage or one presumes so into the liturgy. Now, you, as one who preaches, who is very uh, interested and engaged in Christian teaching, how, how have you been informed in your studies of specifically the Byzantine Apostolos on how to approach this? Well, I should say that my um, choice of research uh, on Byzantine liturgy, the Bible in Byzantine liturgy, was born partly out of inspiration and partly out of frustration. The, the, ins the inspiration part was that as an undergraduate, I was reading some Orthodox theologians um, and I came to read them through reading Rowe Williams, Anglican former Archbishop of Canterbury, and he pointed me on to Vladimir Lossky and then on to other theologians. So I already had an idea that it would be interesting to do something related to Orthodox Christianity. But I trained in textual studies, in textual criticism, um, basically in reading Greek manuscripts, finding out how they differ and editing them. And the frustration part came from an approach to biblical studies um, in the Western world, which is very historically centered. So questions about sources and um, the historical Jesus and the historical Paul and kind of picking texts apart to find their exegetical meaning. And I'd become frustrated with that. And I wanted to look at a way of reading the scriptures, which was more holistic, if that makes any sense. I know that's not a very nice word, but that's the best one I could think of. Um, and what struck me about the liturgy of the Byzantine church is the way that scripture is integrated in, into every part of the liturgy. Um, and the way, as you say, Sister Vassa, that um, it's actually quite a sophisticated form of exegesis to organize scripture and read it in this way throughout the year. And so I was looking for uh, a kind of new hermeneutic or way of looking at the Bible, which was integrated with worship, with worship of God, um, than simply just having historical questions. So that informs how I read and teach the Bible to my congregation, to students for ministry in the Church of England. Um, I, I would I'm, I'm aiming at not sidelining the historical questions, because I think those are important, um, but something that's more integrated and is about worship as well as, um, as, well as analysis of sources. And um, Sister Vassar, I know that 
you're you're an expert in in the divine liturgy in a way that I'm not and I'm very conscious of being an Anglican student of an orthodox tradition um, but what I tried to do was bring a, a bit of critical rigor to that tradition from my from my training and and integrate it with a theological approach right um well uh... We're very grateful, I have to say, and by we, I mean me. <laughs> I'm using the royal we now. Uh, for contributions like this one. I mean, uh, some great Anglican scholars have contributed to our knowledge uh, of something we know so poorly is our own liturgical tradition, uh, the Byzantine one. Um, I think I have the shape of the liturgy, the classic Don Gregory Dix's uh, work somewhere. I think it's in the other room, actually. Um, something I read uh, ages ago. But uh, I just want to say, yes, that we have some great Anglican theologians and historians and a mixture of the two, um, you know, that have contributed to our knowledge of the tradition in the East. So, Father Sam, I'd like to delve uh, more deeply into that uh, whole experience of yours, what would you say is scripture is doing in the Byzantine rite? Is, is it a prayer, could you say? Is it part of maybe, I sometimes thought it's doxological, uh, just to read it in that context. Share your insights of what, what is it, I mean, you, it, when we privately read scripture at home, say even silently, silent reading wasn't even thing, something that the ancients did, right? It was articulated and faith comes from hearing, right? So what's happening when, when scripture is, well, proclaimed in liturgy? That doesn't happen, say, when you're not reading aloud and you're reading alone in the home. Well, there, there's a shared medium for, for one thing, um, all, all, all of those who are worshipping together are hearing the same scripture recited and it's an act of worship to God, as you say, a prayer, which is quite different from some kind of late modern Western ideas of reading the Bible, as you say, alone at home. Uh, sorry. It's okay. Uh, I'll start again. <laughs> I got a reminder in my calendar. That's fine. A modern Western reader of scripture, of which, of which we both are too, there, there's, a, there's an emphasis on the individual and perhaps the individual has a commentary to guide them through scripture and they might be ask, asking themselves quite technical questions about the text. You know, what, what did it mean to the writer and the original readers and so on? Whereas in the liturgical reading of scripture, it's a shared medium. It's an experience of, of worship offered to God. And um, it's, it's uh, I'm trying to think of the, the phrase that I would use, the, the medium and the gospel are bound up together. So you can't come away from it thinking that, the gospel is simply a message passed from one individual to another. Um, it's, it's something public, a public act of praise. And praise, right, right, of praise. Of praise. And, and of course, the, there's, there's a thing in, in the Byzantine liturgical tradition about the apostolos, the, the Acts and the Epistles recitation being somehow subordinate or slightly inferior to the proclamation of the Gospels themselves. They anticipate the Gospel, which gives us the fullness of Christ, which I also think is a really helpful hermeneutic for modern Christian readers, because there are all kinds of debates in the church about the content of epistles uh, and their pastoral relevance for the church. And the way that scripture is ordered in the Byzantine rite seems to be that actually Christ stands at the centre and the apostles, the apostolos, in, in a, 
um, a fruitful relationship to Christ, who's the who is at the centre of the liturgy. So I think that's a really helpful approach too. Oh right, for people who don't know, uh, amongst our viewers, the apostle or apostolos would be read not by the priest, not by the main celebrant, uh, but somebody that's down a notch or a few notches, uh, hierarchically speaking. But then the gospel reading, yes, oftentimes if there is a deacon, uh, the gospel will be read by a deacon, but it has to at least be a deacon. And then sometimes the, like the resurrection gospel at Sunday matins has to be read by the main celebrant, which stresses what Father Sam is saying, that uh, the central focal point is the reading of the gospel, of the voice of Christ himself, right? So Yes, and also um, I think the, the interesting thing about a study of any ancient liturgy, but especially the Byzantine tradition, is that it, it breaks apart the myth that our uh, medieval Western and Eastern forebears, including the church fathers, East and West, there's, the, there's a myth that sophisticated approaches to interpreting the Bible were invented a few hundred years ago at, at, the, at the Renaissance. You know, that's when we discovered how to approach scripture in a sophisticated way. But when you do a detailed textual study of a tradition like the Apostolos, you realise the time and energy and intellectual work that went into um, organising, collating, copying and reciting the Bible. And you realise that actually this is a hermeneutic in and of itself. It's something, it's something equal to the Western historical approach to scripture, that the two, the two go together, I think. And I think that's quite liberating for me personally, um, as someone who grew up in quite an individual, uh, individualistic, read scripture for yourself and cite some academic authorities if you'd like to kind of approach, that actually the church, the church universal, has um, its own exegetical approach, which is just as illuminating, if not more so, than what we can read in commentaries. Hmm. Well, um, I would, I don't know, Father, I would, I would see it more as complementary. You know, there's a, there's a time and place to be studying it, like really studying. Um, or memorizing also, not exactly the same thing, right? Uh, but the actual uh, doxological moment where the word is celebrated and then already heard without, um, I think, you know, with, there's a different kind of hearing that we do in church, you know, that we're not sitting there thinking or standing there uh, as it may happen, uh, thinking, uh, what is the proper dating of this epistle, you know? I think, I think Paul must, I disagree with those that say that he wrote this in the early 50s, you know, of the first century. I mean, it's sort of missing the point, right? But it's hearing sure. in the context of the, whatever the feast is, and I don't know, or you're at a wedding celebration and they're reading uh, everybody's favorite Ephesians 5. <laughs> I'm just, uh, um, what that would be. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, I heard that read at wedding <laughs> about the Christian household, but the you know where where suddenly well for one thing there's an allegorical understanding that uh, already Saint Paul is bringing in about the church and and marriage and the way these two sacraments are connected. Um, so the cross-referencing that's happening, uh, the allegorical uh, capac the capacity to, to understand otherwise, right? Uh, to explain otherwise uh, familiar images in scripture. Um, this kind of thing, I think, rings in, in the specific context of the service, it rings differently, or it rings true in reference to one of these 
other mysteries and the whole connections, the connections happening amongst them. Uh, I, I think that this part uh, is, has to be experienced in context for it to make sense to us. Sure. And you're right that they're complementary readings and approaches. I think that you orthodox, if I may say so, you have you have a gift in the perception of, of scripture coming to you this way, which for many Western Protestants would be a new discovery or a rediscovery of the idea that the reading of scripture takes place as an act of public praise and which has resonances of symbol, sign, uh, mystery, art, music. Th these are things which um, for some traditions would be new, dis would be new discoveries, um, things that have been latent and are now coming back to light. So yeah, what, what seems obvious to one may not seem obvious to another. Um, right. Well, one thing that is obvious to, say, Protestants of various stripes that might convert to orthodoxy is their mind is blown when they familiarize themselves with a Byzantine liturgy. They, because they're generally speaking, much better educated in the scriptures, they recognize things that even though the Byzantine rite means to make these cross references it just goes as we say in the state uh right over the heads right over the heads of most of those standing in church not realizing even uh basic things you know like exodus you know parts of exodus being read uh at the paschal well the paschal vigil which now takes place as holy and great saturday morning or you know just stories that classically were recognized from the Old Testament as foreshadowings or images of what was to come, you know, with Jonah uh, in the belly of the big fish, or that we consider to be a whale, <laughs> um, you know, being related to the resurrection, or the burning bush connected to the mystery of the Theotokos uh, is not recognized by many faithful and when Protestants convert to Orthodoxy, they sometimes benefit uh, immediately from all of this wealth of imagery, say on a Marian feast, to have the reading about the burning bush or to recognize, uh, say, uh, I don't know, the mystery of the cross in the, the, the bronze serpent in Numbers 21, you know, uh, that Moses raises up. Um, a lot of things uh, just uh, go over the heads of the faithful. And so that's what I, what I meant by complementary knowledge, that uh, despite the fact that we can say, oh, how wonderful that the Byzantine tradition latently anyway has it, <laughs> it doesn't mean that that wealth of imagery and uh, exegesis is actually uh, reaching people. Like it doesn't mean that we don't need to study it outside of the services is what I'm saying. And, and the sure. that Protestants have and the zeal for studying the scriptures is something that has been very beneficial uh, to us in this globalized world and in the meeting of East and West that's been happening already for, well, for a long time. Absolutely. And, and I would hope that maybe my study is a kind of humble attempt to bring East and West together with, with a kind of um, using scholarly tools to, to help shed light on an ancient liturgical tradition and make it come alive, if, po if possible, for the people who are immersed in that tradition. And, and also... To, to, to look at our Western liturgy that way too, because there are many parallels in the way that we read scripture. I mean, in my own church, the epistle is read by a lay person normally. Uh, it, could, it could be chanted to a tone, to, to, a, to a, a basic melody. And then the gospel is processed and read or sung at the centre of church too. So in, uh, in studying the Byzantine tradition, it hasn't been a purely academic exercise for me, 
it's something that relates to my own liturgical practice too in 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 parallel and and without wanting to appropriate dimensions of a liturgy that isn't mine right uh, well what is the tradition in your church do you uh have a sermon right after the reading of the gospel that's right yes so yes the 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 epi does does the epistle reading come right before the gospel reading? Yes, so so the, the basic Western form is the same. Um, the the old there might be an Old Testament reading, a psalm, an epistle, and then the, the gospel procession and the reading of the gospel, followed by a sermon or homily. That's the kind of general pattern. I see. Well, thank you so much, Father Sam. The thing is, the reason that we're meeting today is because you wrote this book. Uh, I mean, originally I did interview Charlotte, but the reason I knew about you was because of this book and because of your contribution. I hadn't yet read the book until you sent it to me because uh, that was very kind of you and I wasn't able to get the book on my own. So, uh, I just want to stress the gratitude that I feel for Western scholars, such as yourself, but today I'm specifically grateful to you for having this curiosity and interest in a tradition not your own, even though you sort of seem to be apologizing for doing that, but please, you know, uh, there is absolutely no need to apologize. I could explain a little bit my reticence and maybe my my why I'm so apologetic about about it is that um, in the history of lectionary scholarship, what Western scholars of a previous generation often tried to do was you they they thought that the Byzantine lectionary had a really old conservative text type in it of the biblical text, and they believed that if they um, collated lectionaries, they could find something called the lectionary text, which would take them back to the early centuries of the biblical textual tradition. So what they did was they basically used lectionaries as a kind of mine for interesting variant readings and more or less ignored what they called paratext, which was all of the liturgical markers, lectionary apparatus, for and I, and it, anything that wasn't biblical text, they just went, no, that's Byzantine. <laughs> and of course, that was in the period when, um, in, in, you know, in, in Anglo-German scholarship, classical good, Byzantine bad. So, 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 it, so basically some of what I do in the study is kind of critiquing um, scholars of the 19th and early 20th centuries because they basically just ignored the liturgical context of the of Apostolos manuscripts and just said, well, you know, we're just interested in the early text of the New Testament. And to me, I, I see that as a classic um, Anglo-German Protestant approach to another culture's tradition, which is to come along and say, hmm, what can we get out of this that interests us? <laughs> you know, well, uh, so look, that, 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 that's the background. A bit of a, 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 bit of a, a, bit of a uh, colonialism, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. A bit of that. <laughs> but that was common to any empire you know what I'm saying so yeah, I think it's... but, but, but not, notwithstanding then the way that some western Christians have behaved towards eastern orthodox Christians over the centuries you know so, um, so that, that's a little it bit goes of... it goes very much both ways it goes both ways uh, yeah I mean western Christians have been you know in the modern era uh, far more ready and willing to learn from the East than in the other direction, because for us, it's still considered by and large, somehow contaminating, uh, officially anyway, to have, you know, Latinization, even though we have Latinizations, you know? I mean, the, the common amens 
in the Eucharistic prayer still come after the words of institution. Uh, there's no amen of the people after the epiclesis. A lot of people don't realize uh, that that is a Latinization because the common amen coming from the words of institution is expressing a certain Eucharistic theology that's not traditionally Byzantine. I see I said Byzantine just for your sake, but I usually say Byzantine. Um, so uh, the, I appreciate that openness that you uh, express, that tradition uh, anyway for the last century, I would say, to learning from the East and then also having a self-critical kind of approach to the tradition of the scholarship that's been done up to then. But, uh, you know, we can't really talk about anything comparable in the East. How many Eastern scholars would dedicate, now I'm making a huge generalization and maybe a hundred people will write to me and say that I'm wrong, but how many Eastern theologians will spend, you know, dedicate the topics of their dissertations, say, or of their students to a purely Western uh, topic, you know, or relevant only to the Western, some, some branch of the Western right. So, Father Sam, we're going to have to wrap this up. Could you please uh, say a few words to our viewers before we go? Well, thank you, Sister Barca, for having me on today. It's been really interesting to speak with you. And uh, I, I know that um, you have a course on the Divine Liturgy online, which covers uh, the Apostolos reading and uh, other, par other parts of the liturgy, which might interest people. So uh, do, do check that out if you can. Right. Thanks for mentioning that, Father Sam. We do have a course on the Divine Liturgy, my friends. You can find it here on the YouTube channel. It's called Intro. If you just search in YouTube, Intro to Divine Liturgy. And if that doesn't work or bring up my course, then add to that Sister Vasa, and you will find it here on YouTube. Check it out. Thank you so much, Father Sam. And uh, are you going to say goodbye to our viewers? Bye. It's been really lovely to be with you all today. And I'm saying goodbye. Bye, everybody, and I'll see you next week, same time, same place. Bye.